Good morning from Madrid. My name is David Henneberger. I'm the director for Spain, Italy, and Portugal and the Mediterranean Dialogue of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. Welcome at home, at the office, or here uh, at the hotel in, in Madrid. I want to thank uh, Sana and Patrick and everybody at Womanpreneur, our partners uh, in this endeavor, very much for having co-organized not just the launch event, but also coordinated the creation of the Mediterranean Tech Woman Network. Let me explain you briefly who we are, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. We are one of the six political foundations in Germany. Every party in the German parliament has an associated political foundation. We are the Liberal Foundation, and we are very happy these days because our associated party just made it into the new government together with the Socialists and the Greens. And we have four ministries, the Finance Ministry, the Transport Ministry, and the Education Ministry and the minister will be our member of the board, Bettina stark watziger and also the justice ministry. So these are very good times for liberalism in Germany, and so we are really proud um, to, to present this Tech Woman Network because it lies in the heart of what liberals really aim for. Uh, as liberals, we are enablers, and we are enablers for economic growth, for equal opportunities for all, um, for fundamental rights, and that includes, obviously, women's rights. And here in the Madrid office, as I said, we also cover our Mediterranean dialogue work. And the Mediterranean Tech Woman Network is an essential part of our work here. What we try to achieve is really connect business women in the, from the tech sector from around the Mediterranean um, to, to create growth opportunities, jobs, but also to uh, inspire young women and girls from around the Mediterranean um, to pursue careers uh, in the STEM sector and in the tech sector. Um, women's rights are human rights, and as Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom and as liberals, we support this by our heart. I don't want to talk uh, much more. I hope that we, when we look back in 10 years, that all the goals and aims that I've, just, that, that I've just explained will be fulfilled, and that the Mediterranean really is a more prosperous uh, region, a more positive region, um, thanks to the incredible work of, of, of women uh, in the tech industry. What I especially love about this project is that uh, women from all around the Mediterranean really can show each other how great they perform, how great, uh, uh, how great, uh, yeah, how, what wonderful companies they develop, that creativity is really not based on geography, and that the European side, that women here, and also we as Germans, can learn a lot from, from women, also from the southern shore of the Mediterranean, that it's really an eye-level dialogue and not as so much as it so much happened in the past that Europeans tell other people in the world how to do things. So thank you so much again, Sana. We are really excited about this, and um, let's uh, celebrate women today. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, David. I mean, there isn't much I can add to already what David said, especially coming from a man. <laughs> Thank you so much, David, for this collaboration. We are very happy to be here. I am Sana. I am the founder and the CEO of Womanpreneur. Womanpreneur is an organization striving to push women in uh, economy, make sure that women everywhere are supported to actually be economically independent and be an actor of change in different societies. So far, we have empowered 16,000 women, and we work mainly in the MENA region and in Belgium. And then we were like, OK, we need to take over the Mediterranean, and we couldn't find a better partner than FNF. Actually, the Mediterranean Tech Women Network was a vision of a year now, working with Odiria and David and the rest of the FNF team. Last year, we uh, worked on an initiative, which is the Mediterranean Tech Women Week, actually with a partner, which is Eva who's here with us. Uh, she's running the Mujeres Tech, and basically we have organized a week of different activities, and it was amazing, because women were hungry for this topic. 
And we were like, okay, what should we do more than that to really support women and to really push more women into the tech fields, which are quite, quite male-dominated fields? And then this vision came, and we've been working on it, and we're very happy today to have you with us for the first la launching of this network, which is the first of its kind in the Mediterranean. And it's not going to be just a network to have a nice drink in a beautiful hotel. It's beyond that. Our objective with this network is to assess the situation of women in technology in the Mediterranean, make sure that we listen to women and understand what are the problems to come up with the right solution actions. We want also to make sure that we collaborate with the private sector, the public sector, the civil society, because only with the collective efforts that we will support women in technology. And especially what we want to do is to create synergies between women in these countries. I mean, a woman from Morocco who could work with another woman in Tunisia and create just an amazing business opportunities. This is what we want also from the network. In addition to that, the mentorship, because we believe it's important, especially for the young generation, to be mentored with by CEOs, uh, females who succeeded, because the power of intergenerational mentoring is, is very important. And if we're doing this, because also women's place in technology is very critical. I took note of very important data. When it comes to artificial intelligence, we have only 22% of women globally. And then when you look at the position where these women work, it's in general business development. So they are not behind creating the artificial intelligence. And that is an issue. And if you look, 33% of women work as scientific researchers, but again, we have very few women in other sectors, especially when it comes to women tech entrepreneurs who actually receive only 2% of the venture capital. There is a serious issue here. We are talking about technology. Today, our societies are evolving, and technology is a big part of it. I mean, look, just with the COVID, how many jobs disappeared through the Mediterranean. So we want to make sure that women are in the heart of this change. They are creating the change and writing new history. And that's why the Mediterranean Tech Women Network is actually a call for a change. Because the future of the Mediterranean is female and making sure that we, through this network, we create a space where everyone is supported and everyone has access to equal opportunities. So thank you for being here and being with us in this launching. And again, thank you, David. Thank you, Odilia and FNF for collaborating with us and making this happen. Thank you, Sam. As Friedrich Naumann Foundation, we also show, we opened our office here in December 2019, after we had two offices in the past, after, in the transition after Franco in the late 70s and early 80s. So we reopened, so to say, our office here in December 2019, right before COVID started. And we chose Madrid also because Spain and Germany, we share a lot when it comes to foreign policy, to economic empowerment of women, among other things as well. So we are really happy that we also have a message from the Secretary of State for the Digitization and Artificial Intelligence from the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation here in Madrid, Kam Artigas Brugal. She is very sorry that she cannot be with here today presentially, but she recorded a, a video message for us and that, is, that we are going to show you now. Thank you very much, Mr. Hennenberger and Mrs. Afuetz. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this official launch of the Mediterranean Tech Women Network. First of all, I would like to thank the Friedrich Naumann Foundation and Womenpreneur for the invitation to participate in the launch event of this exciting initiative. I would also like to highlight the great work that both organizations do to promote female talent and to continue creating spaces to connect and share experiences. We are at a time when initiatives like this are essential in order to continue promoting equal opportunities and offering women and girls role models and examples of success in a key sector such as technology. A network of contacts and support that allows us to continue learning from each other and promoting female empowerment. To generate spaces focused on women that allow us to multiply the opportunity to collaborate in common projects led by women that also will inspire new generations. An initiative that is enormously necessary in order to continue promoting innovation, talent and female entrepreneurship. 
I firmly believe that the exchange of ideas and projects is a fundamental process. To promote the cultural change that is urgently needed in Spain and in surrounding countries with the Mediterranean as an excess of union. Because the digital future of Europe must have women's faces. It is time for women to lead this new digital era and to break with an unfair structural gender imbalance negative for our competitiveness. We need to move towards a fairer Spain and a digital Europe in which the voice and work of women need to be valued and recognized. We cannot allow the new digital world that we are beginning to build to be designed apart from us. We cannot leave behind half of our talent, our ideas. We need all the creativity, imagination, empathy and teamwork in order to find different solutions to the challenges of the new scenario. For this reason, Equality is an absolute and transversal priority in all the plans that we are deploying from the government of Spain as part of the digitalization project. A challenge that we want to lead from the public sector and for which we count under the commitment of the whole society through projects like this one. Because only together we can move towards the inclusive, fair and social digitalization we want. Projects such as the launch of this network our proof that we are moving in the right direction. Thank you all for making this a reality. Thank you so much again, Kame Atigas Bugal, Secretary of State for Digitization and Artificial Intelligence. And before we come now uh, to the panel discussions on equality and equity in tech, where do women stand? I would like to hand over the word to Delia Abreu, our Senior Project Manager at the Mediterranean Dialogue Project here in Madrid with FNF. Uh, thank you very much, David, Zana. Uh, good morning, welcome to you all. Is once upon a year, we were at this very precise date uh, at the closing session of the Mediterranean Tech Women Week. So, and during that week we experienced uh, so, so many and we saw so many inspiring women that are changing the world, tech women changing the economic ecosystem and changing also the world by providing opportunities to young girls that all are very much interested in STEAM careers. I'm very honored that is Eva and Zana, they are here today. They, they were also with us one year ago and we keep working in the this path. Today we are writing a new chapter in this story, so I invite you all to stay with us and throughout this event and also to, to keep working together towards this uh, Mediterranean Tech Women Network. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you so much, Odilia. I think it was Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, who said in 2020 or 2021 when he said it, every man should be a feminist and I completely agree. However, I will be the last man who speaks today because this is a day of women and we launch a Mediterranean Tech Women Network. So very much, thank you very much for being here with us uh, here in the, in the room or at the office or at home. Thank you, Zana. Thank you, Odilia. Thank you, Womanpreneur. And let's have a great day. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Good morning, everyone. I am so happy to well be with this amazing woman and continue the discussion talking about equality and equity in tech. Where do women stand? They all have amazing experiences, very diverse. So we have with us here Eva Diaz, the CEO of Apogeo Digital. Thank you for being with us, Eva. Thank you. We have also Rawan Ode, partner manager at Monday.com. Last but not least, <laughs> Anna Verangrigia, Program Manager, Social and Civil Affairs Division at the, Un at the Union of the Mediterranean. Thank you again so much with your time. As Sana was mentioning before, we we're going to be talking about the experiences and what, what is happening. We have different backgrounds, and I would like to start with Anna and asking her, can you tell us a little bit about the existing public policies that exist in the Mediterranean They are supporting women in tech? Thank you. Thank you very much. A special thank to my colleague and friend, Sana, for inviting me today. It's a pleasure, especially because I'm here with women who can bring their life experience. I will intervene from a more institutional point of view. Um, in terms of policies in the Mediterranean, I would say that uh, a lot of progress has been made, but we are still far from reaching um, the objective of gender equality in terms of uh, um, uh, support for women in tech, uh, more in general for women entrepreneurship uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, there are uh, some good examples of uh, national policies in supporting uh, um, women entrepreneurship. I would like to mention one that, is, uh, um, that has been implemented uh, since last year in Egypt, um, they uh, launched a new project supported by the World Bank. Uh, um, this is called um, Closing Gender Cap Accelerator. And this is a big project that has been also um, adopted last week from Jordan, where the focus is on five pillars. And among these pillars, there is a specific focus on innovation technology and digitalization for women in business. And the main objective is to um, support the building of networks and the access to capital. This is what also Sana was mentioning for women entrepreneurship. This is from MENA region in particular. When we talk about European uh, side and Mediterranean level, um, a lot of countries uh, have decided to focus uh, their uh, recovery policies on innovation, digital transition. But unfortunately, there is no a specific focus on women in this sense. Um, one of the last reports of United Nations Women covering the Mediterranean area, more particularly the MENA region, say that only six, I'm not talking 16 or 60, <laughs> six percent of the uh, spending allocated for economic recovery and employment is gender sensitive oriented. So this means that again, we have a lot of work to, <laughs> to do, but from the other side, there is an increasing acknowledgement about the fact that women uh, contribute to a better economic performance, especially when we talk about innovation and technology. Mm -hmm. But from the other side, the figures also at European level are not so encouraging. The last report published by the European Union that is called She Figures uh, about uh, the presence of women in leadership career, sorry, leadership position and in technology career say that women are below the 30% in terms of presence when we talk about uh, research and careers in uh, technology and innovation. And even less, it's 24%, when we think about women's self-employment in technology. And this means that the new policies, not only in terms of economic support, but education, research, should focus on the fact that uh, from one side, uh, women are more present, um, more and more present in the um, technology career, but from the other side, when we have to access to the labor market of to access to the entrepreneurship, uh, there is still a mismatch to be addressed by several 
um, policies, but I will intervene this uh, later on. Thank you so much, Anna. I think it's very interesting to see the discrepancies. Also, and we see that women are more and more present in entrepreneurship. They really want to go in the innovative, but still, when we look at the policies, they're not there yet, but they have to catch up. And this is what there are networks like this and events that have to put in light. Uh, what is still missing and what we should do. I would like you to tell us a little bit more actually the, about the initiatives and the activities that the Union of the Mediterranean have been doing to push forward uh, this matter. Thank you for asking also because uh, um, I'm happy also to say and to foresee a collaboration with the women entrepreneurs on this. Um, the Union for Mediterranean is uh, uh, working on uh, uh, making the um, gender equality a, mainstreaming um, element of its agenda. This means that when talking about employment, um, research and innovation, um, um, development of small and medium enterprises, digitalization, the gender lens will be there. But also when we talk about climate change, our blue economy or green economy. Uh, so what we are doing in terms of concrete initiative, the last that we adopted is uh, um, what we call the MENA Women Business Club. Mm -hmm. That is uh, the opportunity that we are giving uh, to um, several hundred women entrepreneurs in MENA region to um, be part of the uh, large network called Business, um, Women, Business Africa. Uh, the idea is to give to women entrepreneurs that will be selected the possibility to have access to mentor, to coaching, to uh, having mm, direct meeting with more than 6,000 uh, investors, producers, retailers. So the idea is to give them not only the access to the network, but also potential access to capital and, and finance, at the same time to provide with individual services um, uh, in terms of mentoring, mentoring and coaching. And this, it, addressing mainly the MENA region. Um, from the other side, all our projects that are labeled from the Union for Mediterranean have a specific focus on women. Um, in terms of blue uh, economy, that is one of the area where the technology is uh, relevant, but where the women are still fighting in being present, um, we, uh, since two years, uh, we are supporting a project uh, providing either education to uh, more than uh, um, 200 uh, participants and more than 60% are women uh, in terms of uh, research innovation in blue economy. And uh, another uh, topic that I would like to mention is that uh, we are working on preparing a new uh, Mediterranean strategy on vocational education training. And uh, this strategy will take on board the gender dimension, meaning that when we talk about technology innovation, we should also think that how not only higher education but also vocational training should be focused on the fact that uh, women are facing specific challenge when access to the labor market, but also to the um, entrepreneurship. So uh, this is just to mention a couple of them, but we <laughs> I will be happy to answer two more on this. Perfect, and I would like to touch upon the challenges shortly, but I think it's very interesting, as you said, you saw the problems that the women had. Uh, talked about mentorship, talking about funding, and it's about creating a little bit of an ecosystem and the entire value chain at the end, really answering to their needs. So I think this is important for people to know the initiatives that are done because I think maybe some people are not aware of what is done and this is also this lack of communication and awareness that is very important. Can you tell us a little bit more actually about the challenges and the feedback that you have throughout this initiative that you had launched on the uh, international scene when it comes to gender equity and women in tech in general? Um, I would mention uh, the uh, last uh, Women Business Forum that we organized last July and where I had the pleasure to have Sana as moderator. Um, a side event of the Women Business Forum uh, that gathered more than uh, 500 participants, uh, we delivered some uh, um, training on e-commerce, on uh, digital transformation, and we organized also a specific focus on um, gender innovative um, policies for women in rural areas. And we also organize a spin 
speeding date networking event uh, to allow women entrepreneurs to get in touch with the potential investors. And during the training and during this event, uh, women also raise the challenges that uh, are facing. That is basically related to uh, lack of access to networks, to finance, uh, uh, but also to gender bias that they have, that they have to, to face. Especially when we talk about the possibility also to, um, uh, sorry, achieve leadership position. And this, I think there is a recent study mentioning the fact that uh, um, women are still facing in tech sector, uh, we are talking about the big company that could be Google, Amazon, or other big uh, tech uh, company, about the fact that uh, more than 70% um, of women working in this area uh, feels that uh, they are still um, fighting against what we call the glass ceiling. Mm. And uh, there is also another element that, that women uh, raise about the fact that somehow uh, they have to prove and to double <laughs> compared to the, women, the men that they deserve the leadership position, they deserve to have access to capital, they deserve to have access to, um, to finance. So in this case, uh, what uh, in sociology call uh, imposter uh, syndrome. Uh, so the idea is also to work with women and with organization and with partner to raise awareness about the fact that uh, you have not to prove what it is your right. You were talking about human rights. When we talk about women rights, uh, sorry, women rights, we're talking human rights. And this should be in itself enough. But <laughs> we're now the, the public speech is about the contribution that women can give to economic development. But sometimes we tend to forget what that economic growth can do for women. So we should uh, keep in mind both sides, because from one side is true, we represent an added value also in terms of economic performance, but from the other side, we should also think what policy should uh, do uh, to help women to fully deploy their potential. Thank you. I think it's so interesting, because we feel that these problems have been discussed for such a long time that today we shouldn't have to do talk about this again, that we still have the glass ceiling, that we still don't have access to networking, that we have this imposter syndrome. And it's interesting that unfortunately this exists, but it is again policies and actions like these that need to be even more brought to awareness and to light that these problems exist and we need to find the solution, not only focusing about the problems, but also the solution. And this is um, maybe the last question that I'll ask you before moving to our next panels is, what do you think can be the role of international communities um, to push more gender innovative uh, policies in the tech field? What, can, what role can they play or are they already playing? Well, um, I would like to mention something that happened last Monday that uh, it's very encouraging in this uh, science in uh, what can be done. Um, in Barcelona, we held uh, the um, UFM ministerial uh, forum with uh, the 42 member states, a uh, member of the Union for Mediterranean. And uh, Spain with the Minister of Foreign Affairs was there, but also Germany was there, Belgium was there. And I have to say that all of the ministries and the head of delegation were, who participate in all their statement focus on, um, let's say, three main dimension. One of them is climate, of course, the other one is the digital transition, the innovation, the need for more technology, the new um, uh, industrial revolution 4.0. Mm -hmm. But in all the statement, they also focus about the fact all this development should be inclusive in terms of gender equality. And their commitment was quite clear in terms of we need to improve our policies, we need to mobilize funds, uh, we need to train people because uh, uh, when we talk about policy commitment, then when we go to the implementation of these strategies, law and practice, we still need some challenges. And it is also related to the lack of capacity. Mm -hmm. 
And when I talk training and capacity building, I'm talking both for public and private sector. And this is another dimension that I would like to mention about the fact that when, if we think about the solution, the partnership between public and private, but also civil society, should be there. Otherwise, there is some, always something missing in the, um, I mean, uh, in the pathway to, to gender equality in this sense. But also, as I was mentioning, working on vocational training, uh, working on the public services, uh, uh, providing uh, um, support to women uh, entrepreneurs also. And when we talk about mobilizing funds, we should also think uh, how to support this new, uh, let's say, wave of the so-called um, genderless investment. And uh, when we talk about genderless investment, we should also think what is what, which are the criteria this investment should take into account. <coughs> and the last thing that I want to mention is about another specific dimension where technology innovation could be really relevant in terms of women empowerment, that is the social innovation. We, we, we know that technology is really relevant about social innovation, meaning that innovation that could also have a strong link for the well-being of local community. And the women have a so strong link with the local community that they could be the, the best um, ambassador for social innovation and technology. Perfect, thank you. Just a few ideas. But very important points because indeed there are this vision of uh, being inclusive, but it is about the implementation. We can have ideas, but if we don't know how we're gonna do it, we might well, come back and still have the same discussion. And as you said, it's really having all the stakeholders because we all have a, play, a role to play from the public, the private, the social. Everyone has its role to play and it's important to point that out. And as you said, yes, women have some specificities that when we look at today's challenges, when you're looking at climate change or social uh, insurgent, they are the ones that have the strongest link, so they should be more uh, included. Thank you so much, Anna. I want to move actually, and you gave me the great lead because you talked earlier about the tech companies and the private sector. <laughs> and we have with us Rowan Ode, Partnership Manager for uh, Monday.com. Thank you so much again for being with us. And I would like to know from your experience, how has the tech world um, responded to gender equality? And uh, from your position, how have you found your place with Monday.com leading the partnership uh, for social impact? Thank you. Um, and as we're in Madrid today, hola, como estas? <laughs> um, so to answer your question, I'd like to first start with explaining my personal story because I find in these conversations we're talking about women and equity in tech and our personal stories are the drivers for change and how we uh, want to learn and move and grow and scale to the equitable future that we all see coming, right? Because it's going to happen. We're going to achieve uh, gender equity in tech. Um, so I'm a Palestinian American. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, as a typical immigrant family. Uh, my grandmother didn't know how to read and write. She was the fourth wife, married off at 13. My mother um, studied high school, but had to stop there. And for my family, I was the beacon of hope, a young woman that actually dared to have ambition to grow. And when I was about 15, my parents saw that our identities were getting lost within the immigrant experience of growing up in Brooklyn, New York. They were also Muslim and conservative and were a little bit afraid of me becoming a cheerleader. And so they decided to move us back to Palestine. And there I lived in a small village called Hawada. And in that village, I didn't see anyone who looked like me in a successful, economic-driven role. And I looked to my community and I asked, what are we doing? How can we grow and be bigger? And I found that because of the political turbulence that existed in Palestine, we couldn't even think the next step because we were too afraid to survive the next day since uh, we were living in the occupation. And yet, I studied, I went to university, and I studied, uh, I really wanted to study tech, but um, the first part where the gap starts growing is education. In Palestine, we didn't have a robust IT program, and so I defaulted to study finance and accounting. And from there, when I graduated, 
um, I saw that there weren't opportunities for me in Palestine. And that's the second gap, right? Like economic opportunities created within the country where we are from. And we see this in the Middle East with growing unemployment rates, without enough investments in capital, in business, in the MENA region. Um, so I went back home uh, to New York. I worked at Women's World Banking, a fund created for women, $150 million, to inject in gender lens investments. Um, there I was in the investment analyst team, and I helped decide, create pipelines for which microfinance institutions we should be funding, investing in, to give capital to women in microfinance. And that's where I saw the third gap. I really believe that those who are closest to the challenges are the ones who hold key to the solutions. And yet, we don't have access. Women don't have access. And even in funds as incredible as Women's World Banking and other venture capitalists, if, if women aren't there, the decisions aren't going to be inclusive enough. Um, from Women's World Banking, I actually entered the world of politics. I did advocacy for the Palestinian-Israeli peace conflict. I worked with congresswomen and men, ambassadors, the White House, business leaders. And again, the access uh, theme comes back to me because I was the only woman in the room. I was the only Palestinian, the only woman, and the only under 30. And I like to quote the first African-American congresswoman. Um, she said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, you bring your folding chair. And I did just that. I brought my folding chair and I created a hub of Palestinian Israeli women where we met with political leaders, business leaders, social leaders, and marked our place in the political uh, table. Um, and then from there, kind of my story of how I came into Monday, I was at a conference, networking, which is the other key issue that we really need as women, access to networks. I was invited to a conference in Austria as a Palestinian representative to map out the future Middle East. And that's where I met my now teammate, Chen, who told me about Monday.com's incredible social impact strategy. So with Monday, they've committed 100% of our product to nonprofits. Uh, we've committed 10% of our equity to social impact in closing the digital divide. And we've committed 1% of our employee volunteer time to give back, to empower, to uplift social organizations that are doing the hard work they need to do. Um, and I told Khan, oh my gosh, are you hiring? As a joke, really, it was a joke. I wasn't really looking to shift into tech. And he said, actually, we are. We're like hiring a partnerships manager for the social impact team. And from there, I say it's the love story that happened. I became a 26-year-old Palestinian woman from Hawada leading, managing partnerships for social impact for a huge tech company that really wants to do good in the world. And so I'll end with, um, with this. In order for us to get where we need to get, we need to have allies. These allies aren't just women in tech. They're men in tech. They're non-binary. They're board members. They're academia. They're the venture capitalists. And without allyship, without us partnering, working together, we really won't get there. So I'm very excited to be here because th this is how we get there. For sure. I think you also pointed out something very important that is representation. Because the more we would see women in all the different uh, topics we said where we saw a gap, the more we will see that there are possibilities, that it is feasible. Because at some point, if you don't see any women in tech, then you're like, maybe it's not for me. Uh, if we do not have in the education or the universities women going into this, you're like, oh, but then it's not of interest. How many times in universities in the MENA region you would say there's one or two engineers? And now the more we see women, the more we see them graduating, the more it impacts because it's influenced them, showing them that it is possible. So I think this is also a very uh, interesting point, and this is why we need to show the possibility and what can be done, and having profile like yourself and the people who are here to show what can be um, done. Could you uh, tell us a little bit more, diving more again to the private sector, what are the solutions the private sector actually can bring in the table to make sure that women are included in tech? That's a great question. Um, you know, from my experience and from what I've learned, I find that the private sector is often the first to introduce radical changes, to introduce 
uh, mind-blowing um, projects and solutions that can help get us there. And I do think the private sector is the key in driving this forward because of the economic capital and power that tech companies like Monday, Google, YouTube have. Um, I would say three major solutions come to my mind. The first one is really addressing the gender pay gap, right? Uh, research done in tech companies in San Francisco found that the gender pay gap within tech is almost 10%. And with that, I think we need to see more transparency when we see uh, when companies put forward uh, new jobs to say, what is the compensation rate? You know, breaking down the trauma of money dysmorphia so we can have more transparency and clarity about our salaries. Um, so I think first and foremost, the gender pay gap, because we can get there, but if we're not on an equal platform, then what's the point? Um, the second solution is finding real mentorship. Um, I think we found because the tech space right now is male dominated, it's harder, sometimes even intimidating, uncomfortable for both the mentor and the mentoree to oftentimes approach and say, hey, I want to be where you are 10 years from now. How can you help me? And I think sometimes when you're starting out or and you don't want to, you see that like leadership and executives are super busy or afraid to ask. So I would say creating mentorship program internally within the company. So women who are in um, these companies have the option to speak up in a more safe, open, and encouraging way. Um, and I think the third part is dialogue. I think there's a lot of uh, stigma sometimes about bringing up issues in the workplace, bringing up this topic even. I know with Monday.com, um, we have a very open feedback culture, and I think the more we can create dialogue around what's working and what's not, how do I feel as a young woman within a big tech company, and how can the thousands of women before me learn from my experience, I think the more we can find solutions that are, again, driven by us. The solutions come from us because we feel and experience the challenges themselves. I think those were very important points. And as you said, a lot of the time, the private sector tends to lead. But what is good is to, ma to make sure that the policies follow so that it doesn't just go and we know how to even improve them and adapt to the realities. Because obviously, the world is changing. We're talking about the 4.0 revolution. So there are going to be a lot of changes that we have to adapt to. So it's really working hand in hand. And so will be my last question for you now for this part is, what kind of partnership then uh, can we expect and hope to see across the private, public, and social sector to push forward this matter? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's basically my job, partnerships <laughs> for social impact and for good. Um, I feel like in the way that we should approach partnerships is to make sure that we understand who are those that need to be in the room for those partnerships to take place. So tech companies who want to tackle the uh, gender pay gap or equity or getting more women in tech means that we need to partner with civil society organizations who are doing the, the uh, community-based work, the grassroots work. And at the same time, again, dialoguing with governments and making sure that there's some kind of strategy moving forward. I often found back when I was working in politics that there wasn't a clear path that was created where all sides can come together and say, look, this is where we want to be 10 years from now, and these are our separate goals. So I think getting on the same page across all sectors, aligning with the goals we want to tackle, and making sure that the right people are in the room driving these decisions. Um, and I'll say for Monday, and I think for companies across uh, the world, Deloitte issued a research saying that social impact within the next few years is going to make up the core of how companies operate. And I think this trend is key in addressing, creating partnerships, but also knowing that we're bringing the core of social impact into the way we do our work and making sure that women are included every step of the way. Um, so I always say, don't talk about us without us. Um, and in building partnerships, let's make sure that the right people are in the room. Perfect. Thank you so much. And indeed, you. yes, we need to have all the key stakeholders. And let's not forget about the women, right? If we're talking about women, <laughs> it'd be good to have them in the room. I would like to move to Eva. And Eva is the CEO of Apogeo Digital. So she is in the tech. And 
in addition to that, as uh, was mentioned before, she is uh, from Mujeres Tech, so she's also yeah. in the networking of women and helping. So we are in Spain, so I would like us to tell us a little bit about Spain experience in regards to women in tech. Uh, what is the situation, um, how, how many women are in tech, and what have been the changes you saw and experienced? Were there or are there any mm -hmm. specific solution or policies that pushed in that um, aspect? First of all, I don't want to be the last one anymore because it's very <laughs> difficult to add value uh, right now. So oh, we still have conversation after that, don't worry. <laughs> so um, we have been talking about, uh, about figures that are right and uh, uh, concrete experience. So um, I would like to talk about perceptions, okay? Uh, about uh, what is happening. I will say, I will try to put uh, good news in the table because uh, we, are, uh, we are very pessimistic. <laughs> I think that uh, there is um, a strong movement uh, on women in technology in Spain. Uh, a part of uh, women in tech, uh, we are uh, executives in technology in different companies, and uh, we are around uh, 500 in Spain. And um, I will say that uh, uh, women is uh, being integrated in, in technology in companies and entrepreneurs a lot in, in the last years. Uh, we are increasing, and what for me is more important is not uh, the number, it's the interest of the, of the women for, uh, for technology. I think that uh, 10 years ago, uh, women was uh, far away about technology, not only in, in the number of the, of the women that are in, in technology, even in the interest, that is very important. So I think that today, um, of course, uh, we are so far of the quality, but um, the women that are working in technology are very important. Uh, we have uh, uh, maybe, I don't know if 20 or 30 percent of uh, executives in technology, but the women that are uh, leading companies in technology are getting a lot of results, uh, are leading uh, very big uh, companies in Spain. In fact, uh, from the five most important uh, technology companies in Spain, four of them are, are leading by, uh, by women, and it's very important data. Okay, so, we are not equal in number, but uh, we are strong in our position, and we are strong in the way that uh, we are changing the technology sector. Uh, there are another movement that is very important, is the uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, of course, uh, we have no venture. Uh, the funding of the, of the companies that are leading by women uh, is, uh, I don't know the, the number, I don't remember the, the number, but it's, it's very low uh, uh, respect to uh, uh, the startup uh, uh, funding by men. But uh, we are working, we like women, are working a lot in new companies. We are working a lot, for, for example, in fintech, in blockchain, in crypto. Uh, so again, uh, maybe we are not a lot, but we are important. And I think, it is, I think that uh, this is very, very important. And, and I will say that is the, uh, the most um, important uh, uh, new today. Uh, there are uh, an issue that uh, I'm very concerned uh, but, uh, by uh, a data that uh, I knew, I don't remember one year ago, is that uh, the number of, uh, uh, of girls that are in steam cars uh, is going down in the last three, five years. I don't remember right now the, the data. Um, I'm an executive in a technology company. We have facing a lot of problems to find a programmer, woman. It's very important. We have, uh, uh, we have had in, uh, 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 a very strong moment in the uh, movement in the last uh, five, six years, uh, but uh, I'm concerned because uh, our girls is not so um, trying uh, to study uh, technology. It's very difficult uh, to find today uh, uh, a, per, uh, a woman that is in, is in technology and is working in, in technology. So uh, the, the force that uh, we have today, we, we can last in, in, in two or three years. So it's, mm. I think, constant. But I think, as you said, it's very interesting is that even though maybe the numbers are not there yet, there are real impacts that are made. And those are the things that have to be put in light. Yeah. That, as you said, have, knowing that four of the leading, well, out of the five biggest, four of them are led by women, this is a big number. This is something that should show that, yes, there is a growing impact, that it is possible, and that women have a real place. Um, can you tell us a little bit of uh, the kind of solutions 
uh, you'd like to see or advice you might have to make sure, to ensure that there is a greater participation of women in tech. You mentioned the problem, for example, to find the programmers. What do you think can be put in place so that we can grow this interest yeah. and we can have more inclusion? I think that um, uh, we have yet um, a culture problem. Mm -hmm. uh, um, technology is seen like a man profession uh, today. It's really incredible, but uh, it's real. Uh, so I think that the, the two main actions, not about uh, politics or government or ADC, the most important is about references. Mm. Okay? Our girls uh, are not concerned about, uh, we have uh, the f four uh, women leaders in the five uh, most important companies. So if our girls uh, uh, start to see the importance of the women in technology, and uh, they are aware about uh, the, Im the, the importance of technology in the future, and even in social uh, uh, innovative, I think that we are going to change the trend. Okay? First one is that, because uh, today uh, the reference for our girl is not in technology. In, in general, the references are in, uh, in the classic sectors. Okay? So even with the movement that uh, we are doing to promote technology in the society and to promote technology between women, we are not getting to put in the, in the mind of, uh, of our um, our girls, that uh, technology is important, it's not a main profession. And uh, I will say that um, usually uh, we forgot in the fathers. And um, when, uh, when a girl is uh, five, six years uh, uh, old, who is uh, uh, who the, the most important person for them are fathers. And today, the fathers are not promoting technology in their girls. Uh, I have uh, several experiences of uh, fathers saying, okay, technology is important, but uh, I, have a, I have a girl, I have not a boy. Sorry? <laughs> what are you saying? It's uh, 2021. <laughs> <laughs> so, I will say that uh, first of all is explain technology is for all. It's not yeah. a men profession. It's a women profession. And uh, I heard some, some years ago, uh, executive, a woman executive that uh, uh, told us that we have to say to the, to the, uh, to the girls that technology is usually uh, seen like uh, to connect or engineering, mm -hmm. to connect uh, things. Uh, today, technology is to create a, a better society, yeah. to create a, a better social uh, op opportunities, to create a, a new world. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we have to, to say to the girls that the technology is the, is the tool to generate a new society, to generate a, a new environment. Please, let's go to do that, because a good like woman uh, can change the world through technology. And this message is very inspiring. Uh, if uh, you use the message that engineering is uh, to connect uh, pieces, it's not, it's not relevant for, mm -hmm. uh, for, for the girls. And uh, so references, and of course, uh, education. It's very, very important to promote uh, uh, technology between uh, between the girls in the schools and, and it is I think that uh, with with these two tools uh, we can get a lot of impact in technology for women. I think you touched upon something very interesting about what is technology and the way that technology is in one sector it's not computers it's not just that it actually is across all sectors agriculture uh, health all of the important sectors, so the future of tomorrow, technology has to be included. So I think, as you said, it's a perception, it's the references, not looking as old technology. And I do believe, indeed, the message of that it is for everyone and uh, that it is important. And the fathers have like a role, like the families, the culture in which we are growing is very um, important. I'd like to ask, what is uh, your opinion when it comes to the current cooperation we see in technology throughout the Mediterranean uh, area? Usually, uh, Spanish companies are not seen to Mediterranean. Uh, usually, Spanish companies are seen to Latin America and, uh, and Europe, yeah. but they are not uh, they are not seen Mediterranean like a potential market. Yeah. Uh, I was reading uh, some things ago a, a book about uh, the potential of uh, North Africa, like uh, one of the emerging markets in the future. When I told, when I say future, I'm saying one two year, no more. Mm -hmm. So. I think that um, uh, Spanish companies and Spanish executives uh, must change uh, uh, the vision, not only Europe, 
not only Latin America, even the Mediterranean uh, market is, is going to be very important for us because it's very close. Uh, we are similar in culture in, in some cases. And uh, I think that is an, uh, an strong uh, movement of entrepreneurial and technology in, in, in North of Africa. I think it's interesting. It's indeed, sometimes when we look at, uh, we might have fake borders. We have the Mediterranean, or because of the cultures, we speak Spanish, so we're going to indicate it to Latin America. We speak Arab, so it's just one when actually there is a region that can be developed and we should play a, a role. We're today here to talk about the launch of the Women Tech in the, uh, in the Mediterranean, so uh, I would like to have your opinion, uh, all of you, like, what do you think about this initiative that was launched by Womenpreneur and uh, Frederick Noman Foundation? Uh, what are your expectations? And what advice you might have or solution you would like to see so that, as we said, it's not only a vision, but we actually see impact and implementation. Uh, Anna, would you like to start? Thank you very much. First of all, thank you to both of you, because a lot of uh, ideas uh, <laughs> to brainstorm on. Uh, to answer first to your question, I would like to mention a recent report that the Union for Mediterranean and the OECD published on regional integration in Mediterranean. One of the areas that uh, analyzed was innovation and technology. And what the Eva was saying is unfortunately true, meaning that in terms of integration, meaning cooperation, partnership, uh, joint ventures in the Mediterranean is one of the lowest in the, um, in the world. Why? Because, as you said, even if in the same geographical areas, for different reasons, so the economic flow or the exchange or the partnership are going in a different direction, where there is a big potential in the area to work together. And in this case, technology, innovation, especially for women, should be one of the priorities. Also because what Eva was saying about the fact the companies find a lot of it difficulty in finding women with the tech skills. It's somehow um, surprising, take into account that uh, in the MENA region, we have an average of women graduated in STEM that go between 34 to 57, so more than men. So the skills are there, but there is a problem of access to information, access to mobility. This is another big problem in the uh, Mediterranean region. So the idea is that working more on integration, meaning partnership, meaning uh, uh, training, meaning um, specific focus on some area of technologies, I agree when we talk about technology, we are not talking about internet or digitalization, we are talking about smart um, technology. Uh, we should do more on this. And uh, on in this sense, the idea launched by um, FNF and uh, Women and Printer is absolutely in line for me on what is needed but also on what the Union for Mediterranean would like to see more. When I say Union for Mediterranean, I mean the 40 countries, uh, meaning that uh, we would like to really build up on an extended network, uh, including several organizations working in the region. In terms of Spain, I could uh, mention AFM, that you most um, likely know that are, uh, the, um, uh, sorry, the Regional Association for Women Entrepreneurship in Mediterranean, uh, but also with Business Med, that is the Confederation of uh, uh, sorry, Small and Medium Enterprises, which are uh, is working a lot of women. Uh, and the idea is also to work together, but also to see what are the other network working in the region, because the idea is not to overlapping or duplicating initiative, but to capitalize what the other are doing. So the idea is if we know that there is a network, even it's based in Silicon Valley called Women in MENA, in Women for MENA in Technology, the idea is to work together what they have already built up. Uh, so the idea is we are working with 6,000 uh, in women. We should also think how to, to create synergy with them. <laughs> it's okay. <Technology>. Uh, 
<laughs> no, but I think it's important, as you said, it's about integration and also knowing what is done, having the information so we do not duplicate, so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but actually build on what already exists. And it is about showing what is done and really see how, and how we can we fill up the gap so that we have a real e full ecosystem that can really uh, move over towards that. Would you like to comment and add on what you're expecting, what can be done? Yeah, I mean, just echoing every single thing you said. Um, I, I think the um, Mediterranean Women Network is exactly what I needed five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And I am so excited for the hundreds and thousands of young girls who now have a direct, clear network. I want to be in tech. This is the network for me to engage in. And I think that's incredibly important because, as you said, Girls and women are hungry to enter this space, and I think creating partnerships, integrations, making sure that the roundtable discussions and the solutions are coming from them as well, right? And not only um, building partnerships across uh, social sectors, but making sure we're engaging with the governments as well and seeing what policies can be created from that front. Um, and also understanding that the economic opportunities, right? Like, I can, as a young Palestinian woman, I can go into an online training offered by the amazing Sana, um, but then what? So making sure there's a clear path mm. for jobs and employment as we frame this network, so it's seen more as a pipeline yeah. of development, um, and not just an educational opportunity, although that's, of course, very important. Um, and, and just continually assessing. I feel like really having a culture of feedback and making sure we're seeing where things are going. I look forward to working with Sana um, and building, uh, exploring, brainstorming, partnering in with all of you. Um, and I didn't say a disclaimer at the beginning of the panel, but today I'm speaking on behalf of myself as a, a Palestinian young woman working for a company, not on behalf of Monday. Um, and I, I really look forward to seeing where this goes. I think it's interesting you said, is that something that you would have needed, and that's it, is that even if you might have not had it, now it exists for the future women, because we are building the future. We're not just for us or serving. It's really about how are we going to do it. And the other thing, as I say, is like bridging the gaps. It's good to have the training. It's good to have the mentorship. But it's good also to have the jobs so that we're bridging all the gaps so that whenever somebody wants to move into technology, they have their entire roadmap to a certain extent, and they know where they go. It's not that they're going to uh, maybe study engineering or study technology and then end up doing finance or something else, but really having those uh, opportunities. Mila, would you like to comment? Um, oh, you went last again. No, no problem. <laughs> Um, I, I would say that um, in Spain, one of the most important tools in order to promote technology between women has been networks, mm -hmm. private networks. Um, so I will say that the Mediterranean network should be one of the most important tools to promote technology between women. Mm -hmm. uh, and a startup, uh, technology is going to be about networks. It's yes. going to be about collaboration. It's uh, almost impossible for a single startup to grow up alone need collaboration, uh, need to complementary technologies, complementary uh, knowledge and ITC. Um, a lot of startups in Spain are looking to grow up out of the borders because technology is not about borders. It's not a, a Spanish technology or Moroccan technology or German technology. Technology is global, okay? So uh, the entrepreneurs should understand that uh, uh, Spain is not the market. The market is global. And if uh, we are able to create a Mediterranean uh, network where uh, a lot of entrepreneurs around the Mediterranean are in contact, in contact uh, the volume of business is going to grow up uh, a huge. Okay? Uh, they are going to have a lot of uh, opportunities to be in contact with another entrepreneurs, with another technologies, with another cultures, with another market, and they are going to grow up. Uh, so uh, my expectation very high. <laughs> you know. Uh, and I think uh, it should be uh, a tool uh, both to grow up uh, the, the volume of business of startups and uh, to promote technology between, uh, between women. I think it's, uh, it's a great idea and uh, uh, we have to be absolutely focused on, on uh, building, on growing the, the tool and to be sure that it's working right.
For sure. And I think you said something. We always say net, your network is your net worth. Mm -hmm. So let's see how we're going to be able to capitalize on this uh, network, how we're going to be able to have even more women, how we're going to have more uh, business opportunities, because at the end of the day, this is also something that is uh, possible. So. Uh, before we finish up, actually, I would like to open the floor to the participants to see if you have any questions, actually, for our panelists. So there is a microphone. <laughs> we have here a microphone that Emma is going to pass around. And up to at the end, Shirad, uh, we also have uh, questions from the internet. Yes. So we can share, I mean, give some Perfect. minutes to that. So anyone from the audience here would have questions. They don't bite, I promise. <laughs> okay, then I'm going to send, I mean, you from, the, from the internet. Um, for Ryan, yeah. Ryan, yeah. Um, if you could give any recommendation to young entrepreneur women, what would it be from Elena Fernandez? That I want. Yeah, for, for you. For you. Yeah. Ah, for me. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry. It's for me, the question? Oh, sorry, say that again. I thought it was for her. <laughs> I think in any case, you can all answer if you have something to, to okay. add on, so it's not an issue. Would you mind repeating the, the, question. the question, please? Oh, sorry, apologies. Um, if you could give any recommendation to young entrepreneur women, what would it be? Make a LinkedIn account. <laughs> yes. And find the topmost role models that you want to become and literally message them. That's how I rose to the ranks, I think. And I feel like don't be afraid to network. Ask um, LinkedIn. Um, engage in conferences. Register, whether it's online or in person. Because really, your network is your net worth. And if I wasn't at the right place at the right time where opportunity and hard work connected, I wouldn't be here today. Eva, would you like to? Add something as well, an advice. I think we can all give it. I'm not going to, to add anything. <laughs> <laughs> I will add another thing. Like create your opportunities. Mm. Uh, so is that whatever you are, you never know who you're going to meet and why, and be flexible. Because you never, the idea you might have when you're starting your company might change the more you grow, the more you see the opportunities. So do not be stuck on the idea that you have, and keep on growing, keep on evolving. Do you have another if I may, I would like just to give a concrete example because I was listening her two days ago, and she's a Palestinian woman, and uh, oh, I know who you're talking uh, about. Uh, about Madge. Uh, she, she is uh, in engineering, and she developed uh, uh, her own companies that called Sandbox, and she helped people living in Gaza, in the West Bank. So you can imagine how difficult can be there to have, uh, sorry, to have access to anything. And she was able to build up this company to helping the local community to use a specific type of bricks in terms of saving energy. So mm. really amazing. So, and how she did it get it? First of all, what she was mentioned, she got in touch with networks she get a learning opportunity, but not only. Through that, she was in touch with mentors that put her in contact with a large investor, and she was able. Now she's working in Palestine, in Emirates, United States, and when the people in the panel ask her, why you did it? And the answer was, because I didn't have choice. Mm -hmm. Meaning that this is a really good pushing in saying, I have to be resilient because if I want to not only being something, sorry, doing something for myself as an entrepreneur, but when I understand that what I'm going to do as an entrepreneur in technology can help to improve the life of people, in this case, in Palestine in a specific mm -hmm. context, I have to go ahead, but really, Training, education, mentors, networks. This was something that really helped in implementing their activities. Yeah, I will. Wow. Sorry, I just want to say Majid is my good friend and I love her and she is such a badass and you need to go check out Sunbox. And yeah. I met her at a network called Ropes. So there you have it. <laughs>
I will add just actually, do not let your background, um, all sense, education, where you're from, or anything, dictate actually what you're gonna do and what you're gonna launch. We were talking yesterday with some entrepreneur, I won't name her, <laughs> she was in the literary uh, field and now she works in AI. You have so many uh, examples like this where you do not have, it's all about building opportunities, finding solutions. So just focus on the solution and not being, uh, oh, I'm, uh, I'm yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can, can you can you give her maybe the microphone if you don't mind so that she can because that's an example and that could be an inspiration for entrepreneurs as well here to her please <laughs> everyone Hello? Sorry, yeah. put you on the spotlight here. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, so my name is Zahra. I'm a co-founder and chief web officer of InstaDeep, which is um, an AI company. So we're headquartered in London with offices in Tunis, Paris, Lagos, uh, Cape, Cape Town, Town, and recently we opened also in Dubai. So yeah, uh, as uh, the lovely Shira said, um, I started out in the lit field, like. I was at La Sorbonne for English and I just quit because I just didn't like it. So um, yeah, just ignore all that. You, like it really doesn't, you don't need to be in a specific field. You can switch at any time. Nothing is set in stone. Just go with your gut and that's pretty much it. Perfect, yes, Khadija. So to give another example, I'm, I also studied food industry and processes and now I'm running a startup that is in the automotive field. So that, uh, that's uh, really what you're saying. So really don't let your background guide your path and uh, you can do whatever you want. Exactly. And as Rawan was saying, look at the people that inspire you. Check out the, the network and some profiles. And, you will see, and this is what we're talking about representation. What you see what others are doing means that you can also do it should you want to do it, obviously, <laughs> and be resilient. Any other question on the internet or from the audience? I think he had one question here. I just want to take, uh, say some words. I got involved in a womanpreneur because I saw my four sisters fighting for jobs and uh, success. And I got involved with a womanpreneur. I'm very proud to see that we are talking here about technology talking about uh, uh, politics, there is no frontier, there is no border, and this is the powerful place where uh, you should all work. And I would encourage every CEO to be mentor of uh, uh, this kind of event. And I would like to make an announcement, is that there will be uh, soon launching a platform where all the um, uh, internship will be able to exchange from one country to another, from one company to another. So after this uh, nice event, we launch this platform where every young people will be able to exchange with some ideas. Perfect, thank you. Well, here's another advice then for young entrepreneur. Don't forget to go to Womenpreneur and look at all the trainings and opportunities that exist. Please, another question from the internet. Yana, as the only woman in the room, how would you think we can make it less intimidating or make your point be taken seriously? Mm, very good question. Mm? Oh, if, as the only woman in the room. Okay. As the only woman in the room, how would, do you think we can make it less intimidating or make your voice be taken seriously? Um. No, no, you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you have more experience. Um, no, I started. Sorry. Okay, I'll go. Um, there's a, an American poet named Maya Angelou, mm -hmm. and she put it with uh, this amazing quote, I come as one, but I, standing behind me are 10,000. 10,000 women who open the door just a little bit so I can push my way through. That's what I tell myself before um, coming into a room where I know I'm the minority, that there were women who did it before me and opened it, and that is why I am here, not for myself, 
or not only for myself, but for the next generation to have a much bigger um, opportunity and listen to some Beyonce before you walk into that room. <laughs> It'll give you, like, listen to music, get yourself in the field, and I think it starts with um, owning, supporting, and loving yourself, and you yourself believing that I belong in the room. Because when you own that confidence, it translates to other people around you. And make sure that, again, you have that ally, that strategic ally in the room, who will support you, stand behind you, and agree to some of your ideas. So make sure you're doing your diplomacy um, before going into the room. I always do that in prep um, and listen to Beyonce. <laughs> I think that the most important is self-confidence. Yeah, um, I, I think that um, a woman in a, in a, in a meeting with, uh, with men, um, she must be sure that she has a lot of power because uh, she has uh, the challenge uh, to show her capacities, okay? When you are alone in a meeting with, uh, with men, uh, you have to put a lot of effort on showing your value, mm -hmm. okay? So obviously uh, it's not uh, 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 the right situation. I would like to be uh, in equality. But uh, let's go to see like an, a challenge. Let's go, go to see to an opportunity, not like uh, something, uh, something wrong. It's wrong, but it's our challenge to show them that uh, our capacity is at least as, they, as, as their ones. I will add to that that do not underestimate yourself. There will be people doing it. You have something to uh, bring to the table. You have your experience. You have a voice to actually share. So don't worry. They will do it for you. So you don't have to add on to that. And just remember that you have your own experience. You have something. You will learn. And they will also learn from you. Is there another question? I have one last question. Of yes. Course. OK. Um, uh, um, Rowan said that has a lot of potential for change. Okay. I'm just going to do it like this, okay? How is it that the private sector has a lot of potential for change? What can we do when the private sector doesn't realize how much women can, that can bring into the conversation? I think that, I think that the private sector is, is aware about the, the, the power of the woman. I think it's not a, a, a problem of a, a awareness of, of the private sector. Uh, you have uh, uh, told before that uh, we are the responsible of changing. And uh, I think that, that uh, uh, in my conversations with different executives in the companies, uh, uh, they are not uh, um, concerned about uh, have a woman in, uh, in the company. I think that uh, we have saw the po our power, we have saw our capacity, we have saw that uh, uh, we are. Uh, uh, the right one for the for the position, uh, and I think that uh, I will say I, I think that the private the most important for the private sector today today is the talent. Mm. The the key challenge in the next days, not years, days is talent. Today the private sector is is so concerned about uh, getting the right challenge that they are not concerned about. Uh, uh, about if it's a, a man or a woman. Obviously, there are uh, problems, there are culture issues in, in some positions, but uh, uh, the most important should be try to, to show to the private sector our capacity, what we are getting in another companies, we are getting in the entrepreneurship, in order to show them that we have the, cha the talent to get the position and to move uh, uh, the company to the first positions in the, in the competency, in the market, okay? Talent is the, is the key. Uh, the private sector is not concerned. It's, it's the, the battle for talent today is so high between companies because the talent is so scarce that uh, today and the, in the future, uh, there is no problem or concern about this men or women or black or white or etc. The most important is get the best talent. And we, like women, have uh, so that we have that talent, we have the challenge, we have the capacities. Yeah. If we are able to do that, and we are able to, to show that to the society and to the markets, there is no problem, really. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add to that, 
I mean, I think companies, people, humans, follow by the power of our example. And I think companies can lead that way. I can tell you from my experience with Monday, first of all, I've only been in the company for a month. And they're like, girl, tell your story, how you got there. Um, and there, within my, the work culture that I have found in Monday is that egos are not a thing. You can be anyone, any layer of the company, and you can go and bring up your ideas and advocate for change or bring a new solution, say what's working and what's not. And I think as companies, uh, as cultures are driven by the minorities and everyone else, we need to make sure that we're talking about it, that I'm speaking about my experience so that other companies follow the lead and say, I want to do this too. Mm -hmm. And I think in, when you're looking at change, change is the only constant in any case, and people have to adapt in any case to it. So besides being just about women because we're talking about it, there are other changes. So this is where now you have management of change when it comes to companies. So it's more about integrating it. So I think at some point we talked it's about also uh, cultures of companies, about finding the right talent. But don't focus about, oh, it's a new change, because we're always changing and adapting and evolving. And sorry, yeah, I have another one um, from Slim Belkasam. Question for Rowan. Okay, is women's access to technology inseparable from their access to their fundamental rights, such education? What do you think? Sorry, say that again? Yeah, is women's access to technology inseparable from access to their fundamental rights, such as education? Oh, it's key. It's uh, access to technology, I think, is key. I have seen, the world has seen the power of technology in driving social movements like the Me Too movement that created, finally, a worldwide conversation around sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, so I would say access to technology, we need to do it. I know Monday is a driver for this with our social impact initiative being focused primarily on closing the digital divide. Um, and I'll say this, I think not only Monday, but other companies are beginning to open their technologies to the public, whether you're a student, you know, you can ask us access a free Monday account and other accounts if you are a smaller NGO or a company. So make sure that you're also researching and finding all the opportunities because they are there. Sometimes we can't find them, but find them, take advantage of them, capitalize on them, and know that technology is here to stay and uh, let's make it work for good. And, uh, yes, I would like also to mention that a recent study published, that will be published by UNIDO in Mediterranean region, uh, they conducted a, a quite large survey on women and access to ICT. Mm -hmm. And uh, both uh, as uh, access to the labor market but also as um, entrepreneurship. And one of the uh, uh, outcomes was that women, indeed, have access to uh, technology, but meaning access to e-commerce, to the social, uh, sorry, digital platform. But when the, uh, they were asked at which extent you are aware uh, you are using a smart technology, the percentage from 60 uh, was, the, um, I think, became uh, 24. Meaning that from one size, they have a certain type of technology, but they are not using fully the potential of the technology. Yeah. So also in this case, they need training, they need education, they need capacity building. Because otherwise, they can give the access, but if you don't know how to Actually, use them, this yeah. is another problem. Yeah. So sure. it's both uh, education and access should go together. You just reminded me, for all the women who are watching, the nonprofits who are watching, keep an eye out for uh, Equal Impact. It's a social initiative um, powered by Monday, where we're going to be launching opening grants to, do the, to, do, to give access, digital access, not only to women, but everyone um, around the world. So keep a lookout and, and search for those opportunities. And and now for last one, really? <laughs> Anna, no, sorry, okay. they, 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 they just come. Okay, from uh, M. Sanchez, um, what are what is the major challenge for women in the tech sector? I think as a wrap up, it's a good wow. question. <laughs> it's a wide <laughs> question. The main challenge, I would say that it's the lack 
of an enabling environment. Because all we, what we were discussing today is about the environment allowing women mm. to have uh, tech careers, to have uh, her own um, enterprises in technology. And when I'm talking about enabling environment, meaning bureaucracy, <coughs> public service, access to finance, but not only education, training, possibility to get this kind of information, knowledge is power. So you, if you don't have it, uh, it's difficult uh, in any sector, but especially in technology. So I would also stress the fact that uh, this idea of um, uh, women tech network is something really valuable because the idea behind it is if we don't share knowledge, if we don't share tools, if we don't share a network, we cannot go ahead on uh, improving uh, the presence of women in technology. And from an institutional point of view, I would say that we also need data to make policymakers, but also private sector, aware of it. Because if you look simply, you make a research on the internet about presence of women in technology in any region, but especially Mediterranean, it's quite challenging to have data mm. disaggregated by gender, statistical. Mm. And why? Because public sector, meaning also institutional, uh, sorry, statistic institution, they don't know where to gather the data, which kind of tool. And also this is important because when you bring data, <laughs> I mean, it's easier also to advocate for a change, for sure. both for public uh, and private sector. I think it's key is having the right information in any case. Yes, there's a question. Oh, yes, please. No, Go it's ahead. not a question. But hi, everyone. I'm from Sharon. I'm from Israel. And I just wanted to uh, continue the point of collecting the data. Um, actually, I'm coming from uh, the Council of Women in Science and Technology in the Ministry of Science and Technology in Israel. And actually, what we are trying to do now is to uh, find a way to put all the stakeholders in one place, like the government and the VCs and the themselves. Everyone in one convention, ask them all if there's a one way they they can all share the data that we can actually uh, combine all the data in one. So maybe this could be the first um, way that we can uh, use this network. Like every uh, representative from each country can collect the data and we can use and share this data. So maybe this would be the first thing to do. Great. And thank, thank you for you. this conference. It's great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sharon. But yeah, collect, the data, I think, is in any case a lot of an important piece that it might be missing in some of the countries in the region as well, where there's a lack of transparency sometimes, and we don't want to share. But it is um, so this is why those networks are important, because you would have people from the field telling you the realities. Because you might see some data or a policy that you think that people are moving forward. But again, the discrepancy between what exists and the implementation. Uh, the reality of the communication and actually what is um, going on. Is there any final comments or questions from the audience before we wrap up this panel? Yeah, stop. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much for uh, your patience and thank you so much to our amazing panelists for all the information they provided. Uh, don't hesitate. I'm inviting you to talk to them, <laughs> to network with them uh, throughout the day, if anything. And thank you again. Uh, a flying buffet that is.